Good afternoon. This is a lecture on the New North in History 1301. This lecture will cover the industrialization and changes coming to the northern states and the northern territories of the United States in the years roughly from 1800 to 1860. Uh, the northern states are going to uh, track on a very different route uh, than what uh, you'll find down south. And so that's one of the major themes going into the last few um, weeks of this uh, History 1301 course is the growing sectional differences that you find in the northern states versus their compatriots or their, their American brethren uh, down south. Uh, in this lecture, we'll look at the north, and in a future lecture, we'll look at the southern states and how that growing chasm helps set the stage for the Civil War that's going to take place in the 1860s in the United States. The northern states uh, and the southern states were actually fairly similar uh, in the early years of the Republic, uh, even in through the first few years of the 19th century. And uh, the thing to remember is, is that even going up to all the way to the Civil War, the United States is still a rural nation. Most Americans at the time of the Civil War, so again, the year 1860 would be your uh, kind of mile marker there. Uh, coming into the Civil War, most Americans still lived on a farm. Very few Americans actually lived in a town, uh, and in fact, uh, very few at all, uh, to the point where really only 3% of the American population in, in 1800 lived on a farm, uh, excuse me, lived in a city. A uh, city would be defined, FYI, as this town of, to us, a town of 2,500 or more. And so that should tell you several things. The United States didn't have big cities back then uh, in 1800. And even in 1860, they didn't have that. They had big cities, but not that many. Uh, and the definition of a city was uh, very different then than it is now. Uh, most of you who are watching this do not come from a town of 2,500, roughly. Uh, most of you come from the greater Houston, D uh, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin regional areas a few Corpus Christi's or whatever, uh, but the fact is is that most of you come from a major city and would think 2,500 is just uh, is just small, different era, different time. But most Americans did not live in a town that big, uh, 2,500 in 1790, let us say 97% lived on a farm. Uh, and even as uh, late as the 1860s, you're going to find the vast majority, say about 65, 70 percent of Americans still, 70 percent of Americans uh, still living on a farm or a small town, smaller than 2,500. Uh, so in that sense, in the early days of the 19th century, there were a lot of similarities between North and South, but those changes are coming, and, and they're going to take a uh, they're going to take a, a, a lot of different forms. Uh, you're going to see the first form will look at how the North uh, differentiates itself, changes from uh, uh, its uh, southern brethren, uh, is in the realm of, of uh, industrialization, the, uh, basically the age of industrialization, uh, the age of me mechanization, all those sorts of things that uh, we kind of take for granted the day and age we live in uh, were just coming into play in the early 19th century. And so the Industrial Revolution uh, up north is going to be really going to be for us uh, defined as not the whole of the northern states. Uh, I think it's worth saying that uh, when we look at where it really takes a, uh, the deepest root prior to the Civil War, industrialization will be found in Massachusetts, uh, New York State, Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, particularly Baltimore. Uh, then you'll also find it in Ohio and to a certain degree late in the game in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, but really, if you wanted to say statewide, it was Ohio, it was going to be New York, Pennsylvania, uh, in Massachusetts, and that's about it. Uh, so those states are the really where the game is played at. Uh, other states are more rural and just smaller and are not as uh, effectual uh, in that. But industrialization uh, is going to come in fits and starts. Uh, to be clear, industrialization does not begin immediately with the building of big factories or anything like that. In fact, it actually begins uh, with a little bit of economic espionage in Rhode Island, uh, the tiniest state in the Union. Samuel Slater was an Englishman uh, who was going to uh, be essentially an espionage agent, a spy, an, a, a, an economic spy uh, for the United States. And it wasn't, he was not paid by the U.S. government, but what he does, Slater does, is he gets with and uh, he is going to uh, see some textile mills in operation in England, and which were essentially, uh, along with some other uh, things we'll talk about here, those are essentially kind of like state secrets in the early 20, or late 19th, excuse me, the late 18th and early 19th century. But he, Slater, had a phenomenal memory. 
Uh, some of you know what I mean by a phenomenal memory in the sense that you can look at it once and you never forget it. Most of us are never blessed with anything close to that. Uh, some of us have to work real hard to remember uh, how to spell your own name. In my case, Giesenschlag, that was always a bit of a trick. But the thing was is that uh, Slater had that phenomenal memory. And he went through, and he basically, uh, just by watching it and looking at it, he just like a tape recorder or a video recorder recorded everything he saw and had the ability to draw up plans and operations uh, off of memory. Uh, that's how he was able to come to the United States. He was uh, checked for papers. Uh, he was uh, uh, he was thoroughly searched, and he they found nothing on him. They just, of course, you can't read the brain. This is not a sci-fi movie. This is not Avengers or whatever. The fact is, is that Slater comes and he sets out, and he uh, basically uh, is able to uh, to lay out a a mill that can take a raw product, in this case cotton, and turn it into a finished product, not necessarily the uh, the dress or the shirt, but what it does is it takes it and turns it into a product that then can be put out, and that's the term you should remember, it can be put out and given to small mom and pop uh, little uh, textile operations. When we say these uh, put-out shops, these little put-out shops, so these little uh, textile mills, these individual are, are basically family-run affairs. Mom and dad or mom and daughters or some variation thereof in these small towns in New England uh, would take their product and take the, uh, the not the raw product, but the, the, the whole product or the mass product that uh, Slater's Mills would produce, and then they would refine it and cut it and, and sew it and turn it into shirts or turn it into shoes or whatever the process may mean. They would do it there. So it was called the put-out system. Basically, you, you take the, uh, uh, the, the about the medium finished product, and then you send it to somebody to finish it, and you put it out uh, to work. And that's, uh, and that's fine and good. Uh, as uh, time goes on, though, is, is that what you start to notice with this coming industrialization, and it only picks up pace in the 19th century, is, is that uh, as time passes, uh, you're going to notice a declining uh, relevance of highly skilled uh, textile workers or highly skilled laborers in the textile and industrial fields that we're looking at. Uh, what it becomes more and more needed or wanted because it's cheaper labor and can be trained up quickly and frankly lower your overall labor cost uh, is is that you need uh, you need to have unskilled labor. You need to have lots of labor. And so that brings us to the uh, next uh, facet of this Industrial Revolution is uh, something that you, you don't always, as a historian or somebody who lives history, you don't always realize what you're going through or what's getting ready to happen or what is happening is going to affect you in other ways beyond the immediate. Uh, those of us who wish we could, uh, if, you know, if we could predict the future with certainty, we'd probably go uh, play the uh, lottery and try to make a lot of money or, or invest our money extraordinarily wisely. But it, the War of 1812 also had the effect of redirecting the money, in, the investment money in the United States. Uh, prior to the War of 1812 and prior to the embargoes of the Jefferson and Madison administrations on economic trade between France and England and the United States, uh, there was a lot of money to be made in, prior to the war in trade between France and England and the United States. But the embargo acts and the uh, economic policies of Madison and Jefferson's administrations, plus uh, in addition to that, the fact is, is that there's also going to be the war itself of 1812 that lasts three years. All that put together is, is that uh, there was a lot of money, there was a lot of hurt, and there was also some money that was used for investment. So what you're going to turn around and look at and say, okay, Hey, uh, we can make clothing and we can make finished product here. How can we invest? So they turn a lot of New York, but especially Massachusetts uh, and New England investor class, capital investors, they turn from the Atlantic Ocean, as it were, and they look to the interior. And in that case, you would enter into your notes another name, Francis Cabot Lowell. Francis Cabot Lowell, L-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Now, Francis Cabot Lowell is another one of those Englishmen, excuse me, he's an American, uh, he's another one of those uh, economic espionage artists. Francis Cabot Lowell comes from Massachusetts. Uh, he is the scion or the son or the offspring of a very well-heeled Boston Brahmin community. 
And Lowell is going to travel as a tourist. And he goes and sees these great textile mills, these finished product mills that you find in uh, Scotland and England. And he goes, uh, and knowing full well that that is uh, what he was doing was illegal, Lowell would go into these places. He'd ask good questions, but it was obvious he was not uh, measuring the drapes, as it were. He, he asked good questions that weren't too obvious. I had a good memory, very observant, not Samuel Slater territory, but uh, when it came to Lowell, he would go home that night uh, to his the room, sit down, and from memory write down what he observed and what he noted and so on, and what you're going to see with Lowell is going to be, uh, he's going to bring that back to uh, Massachusetts, and he's going to bring that back and uh, basically set up the, the, the Lowell factories that you find in, well, in this case, Lowell, Massachusetts, at the, at the confluence of the Concord and the Merrimack River in Massachusetts. And when you talk about Lowell, Massachusetts, the town, Lowell, Massachusetts is also going to be a company town. Lowell is, uh, in a sense, one of the investors, uh, but really, in a sense, really, you could say for this, uh, this lecture, the story behind the story was uh, one of his friends, Paul Moody. Moody Investors. Moody was a technical chieftain. He was uh, good with mechanics and such. Uh, and it was going to be between the two men, maybe more especially Paul Moody, uh, that's going to set up these, these, um, these Lowell factories that are going to be able to start mass producing not just uh, a, a mineral product like Slater's Mills did, but a finished product in a textile sense. So you have that going on. Now, these Lowell towns, uh, that Lowell, Massachusetts particularly, is a company town. And some of you have heard that expression over the years. Now, what is a company town? A company town is a town uh, either literally or somewhat uh, literally owned by the company that is the largest employer and the biggest uh, doer. Uh, a company town can be used to describe, say, Newton, Iowa, where Maytag used to be used to reign supreme, but the truth is, is that it was never quite the company town it made out to be. But in the case of Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, it, the, the textile mills there in Lowell were owned by, the, uh, by Lowell, Moody, and their associates. Uh, and these are fully housed, fully uh, governed towns. They are, from uh, start to finish, lock, stock, and barrel. The fact of the matter is, is that when you see uh, uh, Lowell, Massachusetts uh, get underway, uh, you ate because they fed you. Uh, you worship, meaning you went to church because they provided religious instruction. They gave you housing. They gave you a job. They gave you money. Uh, you, in a sense, you were a wholly owned individual there in Lowell, Massachusetts. And those uh, those plants are really interesting because I over the years uh, I've traveled some some of it from childhood some of it from my own volition as an adult but one of the uh, earlier trips that Dad took us on was to Lowell Massachusetts where I did get to see <coughs> some of those old factories in motion now, they weren't pump pumping out anything to speak of uh, but those those uh, factories there at Lowell Massachusetts were hot. They were loud. They gave you a, a set of earmuffs, and they actually gave you plugs as well so you wouldn't go deaf. It was probably overkill, uh, but this is a museum, and they don't want people complaining, saying, I lost my hearing today, or my hearing was hurt by going into this room. But these big belt and pulley-driven uh, uh, looms, textile looms, that were finishing the, the dresses, the products, and spinning yarn in some cases as well, uh, they are going to be basically running 24-7. They are loud as they can be. It's hot, friction, and all that's put together. Uh, it is, uh, at times, a very unpleasant place to work, uh, it, and the money was better than it could be, uh, but at the same time, what did you trade off with? And so that was always kind of the complaint. But secondly, about Lowell, Massachusetts, it's worth inch, uh, uh, noting as well, is, is that Lowell particularly, and you'll see this uh, mimicking copied elsewhere, is that Lowell is going to make a concerted effort to draw in women. And here, maybe for the first time in American history, you see women introduced into what used to be or could be called men's work. We don't think of, uh, perhaps you don't think of textiles as men's work, but in England it was. Now, obviously, prior to the textile and industrial revolution that we're discussing, 
uh, there are lots of wives and lots of daughters and lots of sisters are going to do a lot of sewing, but men could sew too. Uh, and frankly, prior to the textile system, uh, it, all this was done, everything that we're talking about was done on a small scale, individual, probably local, and in some cases within the family. Uh, it is fair to remember that you traded for uh, goods and services. Say, if I was a farmer, I'd trade eggs and beeswax, or I'd trade uh, butter and uh, gunpowder or something for a shirt from somebody else. Uh, and there was a, that was really a bartering system. But back out to Lowell, Massachusetts, on the higher scale here, what you're seeing is is that, and this should be, kind of be a, uh, start to come obvious, is that people are going to start to move off the farm. I talked about the fact that you have a lot of folks still living on the farm. It's true in 1790, 1800, 1860. But by the time we get to 1860, there are a lot of folks who have moved away from the farm, uh, native-born Americans who have moved away from the farm. And some of that really takes place amongst females for the first time at Lowell and those uh, factories. Uh, they're called the Lowell girls oftentimes. That's kind of the, the slang term historically for those girls who went to work there. And those girls who went to work at Lowell's factories and others like them, uh, they would be recruited in. Uh, and a lot of uh, these girls looked upon this as a step up, at, at least initially, a step up in life, that they were no longer tied to the farm, they were no longer tied to what had been done in the past, and this is new and exciting. Uh, not unlike some of you who perhaps uh, have looked, uh, now of course recording this, you're watching it at home perhaps, but you look forward to the day when you went to college for the first time and you got out and you were to do something different, you were to get out from underneath mom and dad's wings. Uh, in a sense, that's been a desire and a dream for hu every human being, male or female, since the dawn of time. But uh, when you move away and you go to work in a factory, you are kind of uh, participating uh, in something new. Now, you may come to regret that participation, but at the outset, it's a pretty good deal. And most of those old farmers were glad to see their daughters go, or at least they were glad enough to let them go. Uh, one of the things that those uh, recruiters and headhunters for Lowell, uh, the Lowell and Boston Associates and others like them would have to promise uh, the, uh, uh, these fathers and these uh, families is that their daughters would not be uh, turned out and turned into some sort of uh, a strumpet or something like that because that would be a fear. My daughter goes to town. She can't make any money. She can't get back to us. She becomes a prostitute. And that's what a strumpet essentially is. So anyways, that would be a fear. How and not only beyond that, which is very dramatic and very uh, on, perhaps on the edge, but how is my daughter to be taken care of? I'm just not going to turn. Do you understand this? I mean, I speak from a father's perspective now uh, with my little Caroline, who is uh, at the time of this recording four, almost four and a half years old. Uh, I w obviously not going to turn her out at four and a half, but at 15 or 18 when these little girls would start to go. Uh, I w or maybe 21 in some cases, I, I would have a hard time just saying, dear, uh, go and just have a good time. We'll see what happens. I, 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 I'm protective, uh, and I think most fathers are to some degree or another. At least they should be, in my opinion. Uh, but at the same time, so these, these recruiters, these headhunters from these corporations or these uh, textile mills would essentially say, <coughs> excuse me, would say to the uh, to the family that your daughter will get religious instruction, Protestant in this case, because that's what they mostly were. Uh, in addition to that, they will be given food. They will have regular work hours. They will be given uh, shelter and clothing, uh, or they will have the opportunity to buy it in some cases, and they will have a chaperone, and they will have a protector. So a father could, with a, because he had heard of, perhaps especially after a few had gone on and done this, he had heard that this is a standard operating procedure, and he'd bless it and allow it to happen. And so there will be a lot of, like I can say it like this, there will be a lot of tension between the company and these girls uh, and so forth, but uh, that's uh, things to consider. Now, as a woman who worked in these, uh, in these factories, in these textile mills, it could be very dangerous in addition to being bad for your hearing, uh, but especially in those days, you did not have uh, robust uh, safety training, and sometimes safety training is overblown, I would argue, uh, but sometimes it's very valuable. Uh, say, put your hair up in a net, bring it and tie it up in a bun. No, bun. But can you imagine if you got one of your, uh, some of your hair caught in, in a loom that was spinning, it would rip it out. Uh, very, uh, very harsh things. Uh, very hot, those dresses could get caught, uh, the, uh, the fibers being thrown off of those looms, being inhaled because you had no respirator mask. On and on I can go. It, it can be a very dangerous and, and uh, uh, hard work condition. Uh, and at times boring and repetitive. So that's, that's also in the baking as well. 
They worked about 12 hours a day, Monday through Saturday. Sunday was reserved as a Sabbath day for church and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, is that the pay wasn't that great. And eventually, it's worth noting, is, is that you'll see here and in other factories that are not directed toward women, you'll start to see the rise of what they called at that time workies. Workies are, uh, are basically early, early day labor unions. And those labor unions uh, are essentially trying to uh, organize for better work conditions, pay, et cetera, and so forth, shorter hours. But anyways, the labor movement, I would argue, starts, at least in this country, starts really here uh, in this, eight, this uh, new north and modernizing north. But as we talk about urbanization, the fact of the matter is, too, is, is that we're also going to be looking at uh, the growth of cities and the growth of uh, two particular cities just for a moment of our time. Uh, and that happens to be Philadelphia and New York City. Now, Philadelphia, at the turn of the 18th century, excuse me, the turn of the 19th century, Philadelphia was the second largest city in the United States behind New York City, but not by much. Philadelphia had always been blessed by the fact that it sat on the Delaware River, but as pa time passes, uh, Philadelphia will be blessed all the more by its commitment to railroads. But beyond Philadelphia, and Philadelphia by 1860 will have a population of about half a million. Now, New York City is, however, where we really spend our time. New York City is a uh, is, is going to be the premier city, basically by 1820 in the United States. It will be the number one city in the United States. New York City uh, is going to take off for multiple reasons. A lot of it has to do with things I've already mentioned in class, and that has to do with location. Uh, for those of you who know your geography real well, you know that New York City is singularly blessed, in a sense, to have not only that great deep sea port uh, that we see, uh, uh, you know, if you've been out there, you've perhaps gone to Ellis Island, you've gone to the Statue of Liberty, you've seen uh, ocean-going vessels uh, coming in and out of the, deep, the port of New York, New York or other ports in and around the, that area. But second thing you would also notice, too, is, is that uh, if you know your geography particularly well, thinking back to the American Revolution, the Hudson River, that great natural cut of land, that Hudson River waterway flowing into essentially New York City, the Hudson River flows in, and the Hudson River is navigable for miles and miles inland. In addition to that, uh, up at Rochester, New York, there's going to be the creation and the digging of canals, especially, especially, put this in your notes, certainly, the most important, or at least the, uh, the, the most ballyhooed and the first of the canals, and it is very noteworthy and very memorable, you ought to remember it, is the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal from Rochester out to uh, Buffalo to the er Lake Erie, that canal is going to connect New York City with the interior. Throw in as the uh, decades pass in the 19th century coming toward the Civil War, you're going to see the development uh, and the building of new railroads. Railroads in New York State, <coughs> New York, uh, and, and so on. And those railroads are going to be tied into Ohio and points beyond that. So all this is to say is, is that location, location, plus transportation and the ability to, or logistics to move goods and to sell and to, to, to trade. New York could trade with the interior of the United States going all the way to Ohio in some respects, at least northern Ohio, and New York could trade with England and Scotland and so forth after the war, after the War of 1812, when the tra things kind of get back to normal. And so New York is in the best of all worlds. Throw into the mix by 1820, New York is really establishing itself as the premier financial uh, center of the United States. The New York Stock Exchange has already been established. New York is a monetary capital trading hub in the United States. But back to the Industrial Revolution part, and the textiles particularly, you will find in New York City a lots and lots of uh, men and women, immigrants, which is another story that's going to come in just a second, but lots and lots of men and women who will spend their time in their daytime in some squalid conditions in some cases, better than others, but they will be sewing. And that idea of unskilled labor, cheap labor, sewing up shirts and such, sewing, sewing up pants, putting together shoes, cheap shoes, maybe slightly more expensive, but mass-producing finished product. You find that not just at Lowell, Massachusetts, but in these, these uh, essentially in a sense kind of like it was, but uh, these put-out shops or these uh, home uh, sewing shops throughout New York City. So New York for the 19th century and into the 20th century will be a garment center in addition to being a trade center. Maybe it all just goes hand in hand. 
But also something to noteworthy, uh, noteworthy as well is that you find it in New York, you find it in Philadelphia, you find it in the East, is, is that you're going to see what's called the American system. The American system was developed uh, poorly, but developed by Eli Whitney. Uh, it takes, and the American system is kind of the idea of the interchangeable part. Uh, just think about uh, this, that in the early days prior, to, uh, at least in an American sense, and by the way, this is not an American invention. The British do it first. We just do it better. But the fact is is that the, uh, the American system would take, uh, prior to the American system, excuse me, if you wanted to have a gun made, you'd go to a gun manufacturer, a gunsmith, and say, all right, I need a rifle made. I want it 50 caliber, 32 caliber, whatever rifle is. <coughs> and he would tell you, well, we kind of do this, we kind of do that. And it's kind of an artisan's job. Uh, you can uh, uh, make it ornate or what have you. It's not mass produced. It was one at a time. And so you could have some sloppiness, some uh, tricks of the trades. It just depends on what you got, kind of uh, that sort of thing. But what Eli Whitney does uh, is he, especially with uh, rifles and firearms, because he uh, landed a big contract around the year 1800 for the U.S. government, but to develop and build rifles quickly and interchangeably. And so what he did was he created molds that would create exact parts. You know, I need 50,000 hammers on the, not, not like hammer in a nail, but hammer on a gun, firing ha hammer. Or I need 50,000 uh, 50, barrels, or I need 50,000 receivers, I need this, 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 and they're all the same, the interchangeable part. Today, we think nothing of it. It's uh, For those of you who work on your own car, it's nothing to go down to AutoZone or Napa and say, oh yeah, I need uh, a water pump for a 95 Dodge truck, or I need an uh, alternator for a, a 08 Chevy uh, Silverado, and they've got one. It's just their interchangeable parts, and that's kind of what we look at today, and we think nothing of it because it's so common and was so superior. But Whitney starts it, and others refine it, and they produce uh, machine parts that are by done by an exact lathe, and if far at that for what they were doing with watches and particularly gun parts and other things, uh, those exact parts is the way to go. And boy, you can start mass producing left and right like that. So. Uh, this American system really takes off in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, and you find it uh, in New York. You find it in Boston. You find it in smaller towns and so forth. And that brings us to the next thing that we'll see changes going on in the United States in this time period, especially the northern states. Is, you didn't see this next one, like you didn't see the industrialization in the south that you do in the north. You'd also see in the north loads and loads of immigration. This is one of the great, there's been many great immigrant uh, migration waves into the United States, but this is one of them. In the uh, first decades, in the first half of the 19th century, you're going to see immigration tick up and just explode into northern, the northern states. Uh, and really, that, that was a change from the essentially from about 1790 until about 1820. After 1820 especially, you really see it pick up, and really after 1840, it really picks up all the more. And the two uh, territories where all this immigration really comes from, and there were going to be other Europeans who come, but the two territories where the, the main flux and flow of the immigration in the United States is from Ireland, which many of you expected, and also Germany, which maybe few of you fewer did. When it's all said and done, there's going to be 1.89, excuse me, 1.795 million, roughly, uh, immigrants from uh, Ireland into the United States in the years between about 1820 and 1860. In addition to that, in that same time period, you're going to see about one and a half million Germans. My family, the Giesenschlag namesakes, we showed up in this time period. We came to Galveston. As far as the Irish are concerned, what are they fleeing from? Well, first of all, they're fleeing from famine, uh, hardship, persecution, one or all, uh, and they come to North America, and they come to Boston and to, to a lesser degree Baltimore, certainly New York City. You'll find them in Philadelphia and, and especially along the coast. 
And what's also noteworthy about those Irish immigrants, that many of them were so very, very poor. Uh, and what you found also is, is that when they got off the boat, many of those Irish were unfortunately taken advantage of by con men who are going to uh, either secure labor contracts uh, with these men and then put them into sweatshops or something akin to that. Uh, these Irish will oftentimes work some of the hardest and most deadly jobs that you find in the uh, industrial uh, industrializing New York or other cities and towns. Uh, it, it's some hard, hard labor. And on top of that, these Irish, as they come in, they're going to be f uh, living in, in squalor in some cases. Maybe 15 people to a room, maybe 20 people to an apartment. The point is this. Uh, they're going to be really the working class and the working poor of the uh, emerging United States. And it's also fair to remember, and you see this post-Civil War and you see this pre-Civil War, uh, here with the Irish, the Irish tend to uh, congregate around their community. The, the proverbial birds of the same feather flocking together idea. And so the Irish congregate together in their enclaves and their, and their barrios, to use a Texas, uh, San Antonio term particularly, I guess, uh, their, their enclave in a community in, in New York or Boston or wherever. And you find them doing exactly that. And it's uh, centered around the church. Very important to remember that uh, is, is that, uh, that it's going to be centered around the church. But as you also should know, this is also a, a big Catholic uh, community. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of the Irish who come to North America and come to the United States in the 19th century prior to the Civil War and even after the Civil War are going to be 95%, probably 98% Catholic. I haven't ever looked at the numbers, but I know enough to know uh, about religious identity and so forth in communities and, and towns is, is that in the 19th century they would have been overwhelmingly Catholic. And that's my point. So you're going to be finding these communities uh, uh, circling around the parish either for religious reasons or social reasons or all of the above. Uh, so the church is going to be extraordinarily important. And it's fair to remember that uh, for a lot of old, uh, by the way, I should say this about immigration, there is no immigration restrictions in this time period. There's no immigration enforcement. Basically, if you can get on a boat and get over here, you can come to the United States. And uh, the idea of citizenship back then was very different than it is today. You don't, back then you really didn't have formal citizenship in the sense that like today you would be formally stated in the Constitution at least, whereas today uh, the 14th Amendment says you are a citizen if you are born in the United States, basically. Uh, where prior to the Civil War, prior to the 14th Amendment, it, it was kind of a undefined term, you're a citizen. Well, how long do you have to be here? Well, you know, who knows? But all that to say is, is that these immigrants didn't face any restrictions prior to the Civil War to speak of. If you could get here and you could get off the boat, you came to America. That's fine. But the Irish are going to come in massive numbers. And uh, many of the Irish are not going to be excited about the Civil War uh, when that comes uh, because many of them looked upon, uh, especially the male laborers, are going to look upon those freedmen, former slaves after the war is over, uh, as potential rivals for some of the uh, for some jobs, it's a kind of a protection idea that they were opposed to. Uh, that they were opposed to the freeing of the slaves. Some of them were, anyways, because it would be to take bread out of your own mouth. But you'll find uh, these Irish in large numbers. Uh, and remember, this is that many American old line Americans are going to be uh, anti-Catholic to some degree or another, just simply because of uh, the old histories of the Protestant versus Catholic fighting in Europe that we've discussed earlier in the semester. Fair to remember also, too, is, is that you're going to see some anti-immigrant uh, political parties pop up in the 1830s, 1840s, uh, something you'll see that a little bit with the anti-Mason party. They get that way a little bit. And then later in the 40s and 50s, you'll have what are called the know-nothings. Uh, it's, uh, the Know Nothing political party, I'll talk about it more later, but one of their wings was that they were anti-immigrant, uh, so anti-Irish especially. But now to the Germans, the Germans come in large numbers. The Germans come to about tune of about a million and a half in that same time period. Uh, and that's a pretty big uh, movement. And on top of that, however, you find them religiously much more diverse. You'll find a good number of the Germans, probably about 55, 60 percent, it seems like, being Lutheran. Uh, another 40 or so percent, maybe 45 percent being Maybe I'm doing my numbers right. Yeah, roughly about 90% are going to be Christian, uh, 
the majority of those who are Christian are going to be uh, Lutheran. A sizable minority of these German immigrants are Catholic. I, I, my family was German Lutheran. Some of you watching this maybe come from Germany uh, back prior to the war, uh, the Civil War. And you were German uh, Catholics. However, there were also several uh, uh, several thousand, in fact, many thousands, who come to North America from Germany who were German Jews. And then even beyond that, famously out of the hill country of Texas, I always think of and make this point to you, uh, is is that you'll see, uh, and it's true else up north, but you're going to see atheist Germans who were high intellectuals who'd been ejected out of Germany because of failed revolutions in 1848 Germany. It wasn't German there in Germany yet, but it's soon to be. All this to say is, is that many of the Germans who come to North America, come to the United States, uh, it's fair to remember too, is that they're probably a little higher uh, as far as skilled, uh, as far as background, that many of them are farmers, whereas many of the Irish are not. Uh, some of them are um, what we might call middle class immigrants. They would move to the American, uh, to the Americas. They might land at New York. They might land at Philadelphia or some other eastern seaport. In my case, my family's case, we first landed at New Orleans. Uh, and we don't stay there. And that was different from the Irish. The Irish stayed along the coast mostly or in big cities. You find these Germans moving westward. Many of them will go to Ohio. You'll find them scattered throughout the Midwest and in western Pennsylvania and so forth. You find them everywhere. And generally speaking, the um, old line Americans, because there had been Germans in America prior to the revolution, uh, many Americans accepted the Germans better than they did the Irish. Uh, many old line Americans, what I mean by that is native born. All that to say, though, is, is that uh, there's a lot of immigration in this pre-Civil War period. It's worth noting that uh, in the terms of how many are living in, a nor in the North, by 1860, one in three white males uh, in the North were immigrants, were first-generation immigrants. Literally, they came off the boat. So that when you look at the Civil War and you look at those outfits in the northern armies, the, the Army of the Potomac or the Army of the Tennessee or who, where, whichever army you're talking about, you're going to find lots and lots of men who are Irish in some state. You've got the famous Irish Brigade, but you'll also find lots of Germans who sometimes acquit themselves well in combat and other times not a bit. But the fact is, is that you will find the American Army, the Union Army especially, being heavily, heavily, uh, immigrant uh, laden, and we'll talk more about that statistically in a later lecture when the Civil War rolls around. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of immigrants in the northern states, and it's true, especially in the cities. Uh, about around the time of the Civil War, you're going to find Boston and New York basically having approximately half of its population being foreign-born. That was very high, and at times it'll get higher after the Civil War. Uh, it is uh, very, very big. So the cities are growing. People are moving to the United States. All that's uh, fair game. Uh, in addition to that, to give you some more statistics uh, for your dining and dancing pleasures, uh, urbanization is rapidly becoming the deal in the United States. Now, again, do not make the mistake of thinking that people or all a majority of Americans or a majority of Northerners live in the cities prior to the Civil War. It's because they don't. That'll happen after the Civil War. It'll happen closer to the year 1900. But in the uh, of cities of 2,500 or more, 6% uh, of Americans lived in cities of 2,500 or more in 1820. By 1860, by 1860, that number's jumped, as I've said earlier, to 20%. That's moving up. It is moving up. It's moving up. And so urbanization is attractive for those who are moving in, and urbanization is attracting people, old Americans off the farm, but especially immigrants. Uh, and to live in that city uh, is uh, a, a horrific thing. Uh, a city, for those of you and a couple of you watching this have seen me lecture on this uh, when I talk about it in 1302, living in a city in America in 1840 versus 1880 is not a heck of a lot different, or even 1890. Uh, what was said in 1890 or 1900 by the, the waggish uh, columnist H.L. Mencken, uh, who was uh, born in Baltimore in the 19th century, said he said about Baltimore, it smelt in the summertime like a billion dead polecats. Would have been true of New York City in 1845 or 50. Uh, it was grungy, dirty, foul water. And just think of it this way, swarms of pigs ra ranging through. Uh, it stunk to high heaven, people stacked on top of each other, and you will have uh, some horrific outbreaks of various diseases. 
uh, in a 1302 class to go into much greater detail about the blessings of modernity. Uh, but in 1845, where we are, 1850 or 60 even, uh, the United States is still very uh, primitive and so is the world. We don't have germ theory yet. Uh, viruses haven't been detected, not come to any sort of understanding prior to 1900. And so uh, one of the things that I do mention in an O2 class, and I'll mention very briefly here, is, is that one of the things that makes us live longer is water and how we handle water. We, treat, we keep water clean on the front side, and we handle the waste on the back side, as it were. And we handle waste on the back side, literally, in other fa facets. They didn't do that in that time period. And this was true in London, it's true in New York, it's nothing new. But just imagine all the, the, the smells and sights and sounds, fouled water. You will get in New York and other cities great yellow fever epidemics. You'll get great cholera epidemics, which is a waterborne disease. Uh, typhoid uh, epidemic gets going uh, many times, and that's, uh, what is that, consuming or getting uh, fecal matter into your system. It's, it's, it's very bad. All that to say is, is that uh, infant mortality rates in, in New American cities were high. Uh, life expectancy was uh, low, though it's actually going to go up after the Civil War. I will not say that. Uh, but it is uh, a thing to be. And you will see uh, it, uh, New York in some respects was so bad that even the great uh, cynic uh, and the great writer uh, Charles Dickens, and some of you know of him, of the tale of the two cities, Bleak House and so on. And Charles Dickens was uh, uh, acquainted with Squalor uh, being a writer in London and, and England, which was no picnic. Uh, he was shocked by how foul and nasty New York City was, the four points, uh, or five points, excuse me. The fact of the matter is, is that it was an unpleasant place to be. You much preferred to live in the, co the country or the small town. It was much uh, safer for you uh, than uh, the city. Though, if you were to get drafted in the Army in the Civil War, I'll say this. Uh, the country boys didn't do as well in the army as the city boys did. And the city boys, it's because if you survived in the city, uh, you had a pretty robust immune system, whereas in the country, maybe not so much, because you just weren't tested nearly as harsh, harshly. Well, anyways, you're going to see the growth of cities, immigration, urbanization. Uh, you're going to see uh, industrialization. You're going to see a lots and lots of changes take place in North, uh, North America. Some of it's going to be also going to see social movements. I'm going to save some of my bullets on the social movement and religion for a later lecture on the Second Great Awakening and all that comes out from that. But you're also going to see the rise of utopianism in the North. Uh, utopian communities can take secular forms, meaning there's uh, not uh, a religious element. You're just trying to create a new society and a new man. Uh, other times you'll see it in an explicitly religious fashion, refor reformation of Christianity, ejection of Christianity, and creating new societies. You're going to have uh, uh, Robert Owen in uh, Indiana is going to have kind of a, a commune system, and most of these actually are kind of communes. Some of them inculcate ideas of complex marriage. That's the polite uh, term for having uh, uh, multiple spouses, uh, kind of polygamy type situations. Others will promote uh, at times uh, communal living, free love, etc. Uh, interracial uh, issues, uh, and then it's other times they'll say no, 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 like famously the Shakers, uh, which is uh, started by an English woman named Anne Lee, Mother Anne, uh, and they take take up shop. The uh, Shakers, they're going to uh, be so they're going to be fanatically opposed to sex, and so they 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 don't have children basically. Uh, and they make great furniture. You get shaker furniture, real shaker furniture. You're some. You got some uh, good furniture on your hands. And then you got John Noyes, who creates the Oneida community, which was a free love community uh, at its core, a communal uh, operation uh, that eventually disbands after he dies, and they set up making Oneida uh, silverware. Uh, there's much to be said about all those, and I'll probably put them on a review sheet for your optional exam uh, just to get it all in. But at the end of the day, the, the thing is is that uh, when we, we talk about this, the North is changing, uh, and it's some of its immigration, just some of its growing, it's, but it's a changing toward modernity. You do not see these things occurring in the South. The South is very different. It's not growing as fast. Uh, it's a different economy. Uh, and that's all to say, again, reminding you that many farmer, many Northerners are still on the farm. They're not leaving the farm just yet. But that is happening, and we're, you know, if you think about it, right now you kind of get deep into the weeds in a lecture, say, here with the modernizing north. Just remember this, you're only, if you're talking 1860 America, with the outbreak of the American Civil War, you're only uh, 60 years away from officially having an urban America. Uh, and realistically, it was probably true in some states of that part of the world, meaning the northern states, 
uh, in the, the year 1900, roughly. So, in a sense, where you can get close, but then you got to draw back and look out in a wider area and say, ah, this is uh, rapidly taking place, and it is. So, uh, the modernizing North, uh, that's, uh, that is one element. The next lecture should be the Old South, but uh, we'll see you next time.